alive. Those are the two alive moments. Okay? All right, now. Well.
There's still a little mystery as to how we check when the batteries. Are. Test, 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 test. How were the lights? That's just...
Can you tell we're getting closer to Christmas? It's beautiful, isn't it? This is a, such a sacred and joyous time of the year. Even more so with you all here today. I'm sounding a little loud for my liking. Thank you, Clayton. We uh, want to welcome our worshipers today. If you're a guest with us for the first time, help yourself to a candy cane, which happens also to be in one of the congregational church cups. You'll find that on the back table on the right side, my right side. And we're just delighted you're here today. Moving on with our announcements this morning, friendly service quilters work all year long creating beautiful quilts that are distributed to different agencies in town for those in need. On December 12th, this coming Tuesday at 9, they'll be quilting and visiting and celebrating with their annual Christmas potluck even if you've never been there before, you want to be there this week. It's always a wonderful feast of fellowship and food, and you are welcome to join them. Bake cookies with Jane. Now that sounds like fun. <laughs> Jane works at Taste Tastefully Simple, and I'll tell you, she's got some Instapot recipes that I'm just itching to get my hands on, but she's also an ace cookie baker. The cookies that we make this year will be uh, distributed at the time of our Christmas Day dinner, and it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, learn from the pro. You don't have to bring a rolling pin or ingredients, just show up on Friday, I think between 1 and 5 in the kitchen on the lower level, and uh, bake cookies. We're asking if you haven't already had an opportunity to sign up. Today's the day we'll be serving that Christmas Day dinner. Uh, last year, I think we served almost 500 people in our community. It's a free meal, and uh, it's always a delight to be with 500 of our close, closest friends and neighbors at a time of the year that it's, it's wonderful to, to share in fellowship. A moment for mission today is, uh, is uh, with Barb. Barb, what's your last name again? Barb Larson is with us today, and I'd like to invite Barb to come forward. She's going to be sharing a word about our Meals with Care account special Tree of Lights fundraiser. You should know that already, uh, thanks in large part to the Women's Fellowship, we have $409 worth of Christmas lights to light at $25 a light. So while Barb speaks... Kathy and I are going to light lights as fast as we can. 16 of them today. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for inviting me um, for this very worthy cause. Our Meals with Care account, many schools will call it um, an angel account. Um, we started this pr probably before the um, angel account became prevalent in the United States, but in Douglas County, um, which serves all of our schools in Alexandria and Gar Garfield, Carlos and Miltona, there is a poverty rate of um, a, just under 32%. Uh, even though the federal government has uh, free and reduced meal benefits that families can fill out, there's a lot of students that, and families that fall kind of between the cracks. Some of the things that we use the Meals with Care account are um, a parent that, has been, uh, that is uh, very ill, out of town, um, not here to pay the, their, their bills, um, when someone loses a member of their family, um, we will help the family out with um, putting money in their Meals with Care account. Um, unfortunately, there's also some families that um, don't have the family dynamics that you would want to have, and par parents or a guardian may um, neglect the needs of the, of the child in their family, and we try to work with them. We try to get them to fill out the paperwork. Um, we try to get them to pay their pay their bills, and um, it's not the it's not the child's fault that um, they cannot bring money to school. Now, a lot of um, community members think that because we're public education, that meals are free. They're not. The public education is for the general fund of general education of the classroom, um, and meals is run like a business. We do have uh, federal funds that reimburse us for free and reduced meals, and we have some state funds, but they're um, a 
a meal costs actually about just under four dollars and we will have the families pay like 265 in an elementary school and so we need to make up the difference um, if the families do not fill out their paperwork sometimes they're overwhelmed with all of the um, uh, things that they need to do to make the, meet the needs of their family and um, they'll get in the rears with um, some of that also so uh, it is not meant for people that do not pay their bills um, want to go on vacation, uh, want to do other fun things with their family. We do not use it for that. We don't exempt them. Um, but it is, is, it is meant for kids that um, really have a need. We work with the social workers. We work with the principals. We work with the classroom teachers. Um, so. Awesome. Thank you, Barb. <laughs> and we appreciate everything that you do to help these students because what um, your help um, really helps them do well in the classroom. That's their oh, work. Yes. Like, I go to work every day, but their work is going to the classroom and learning. And um, it's very critical. It will cover some breakfast, it will cover some lunch. And I think um, Barb asked me, how far would $25 go? For an elementary student, it would um, cover 12 or 13 breakfasts and about nine lunches. Um, so um, your work is going for a very good cause and we appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, and for the good work you do. I'd invite all who are able to please rise. Let's take a moment to greet those around us. Pass the peace and the love and joy of this season. Welcome to First Congregational United Church of Christ, where people believe, belong, and become. Good morning, Greg. Hi, Margaret. Please remain standing as we continue in worship this morning. I'd invite you to, at this time, uh, hear the choral introit as we focus our hearts and minds on our worship of God. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the season of Advent that reminds us that your love stopped at nothing to save us and to claim us as your own. Precious children, each and every one of us. Keep us awake during this season so that we may be able to receive all that your Holy Spirit wants us to offer. Speak to us now. Fill us with your power and your grace. Let us leave this place of worship a changed people with hearts and spirits and minds willing and ready to be your light in the world. Amen. Amen. Please join now in our responsive call to worship. The day of God is coming. Lift up your voices. Cry out to God with hope and know that God hears you. We wait God's coming day with anticipation. We seek the peace and comfort which passes all understanding, which God provides. Comfort, comfort my people, says our God. I will speak tenderly to my suffering people. God's hand is upon us in blessing. How good it is to be welcomed by God's steadfast love. Now let the God 
God of Israel, who comes in love and power, who raises from the royal household Israel, who holy prophets God has sworn to free us from all harm, to save us from Jesus says to you and me, his loved disciples, in Matthew eleven eighteen, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Today we light two Advent candles. The first candle illuminates patience in the areas of our lives where God has called us to wait. The second candle extends the promise of light and strength to all who feel weary and weak in the dark shadows of this world. As we continue our Advent journey, may our hope be rekindled as the light of God's love grows brighter in us each day. Amen. Thank you. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalms. It's uh, chapter 85, verses 1 and 2 and 8 through 13. The psalm this morning begins by remembering a past when God restored the community and now that community is struggling again. Uh, this psalm is placed in the period of return right after the Babylonian exile, and it prays that God will once more bring renewal. 
The pivot comes in verses 6 and 7. Uh, if you'll listen for that, you'll hear a plea for renewal and a demonstration of God's unchanging love. And then the verses 8 through 13, they are remarkably poetic images, a promise for such just a renewal. The terms used in those verses you will hear are peace, salvation, glory, steadfast love, faithfulness, righteousness. These are terms central to ancient Israel's faith formation. They characterize God's involvement in the world to bring this faith community to wholeness in life. The words that you will hear in this psalm, it's a way of describing peace. The Hebrew word for that is shalom. So shalom is much more than the absence of war and conflict. It is a sense of well-being. A kind of wholeness is centered on life in the presence of God. Hear now the psalm this morning. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. And righteousness will look down from the sky. Live what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and wake, make a path for his steps. rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be.
At this time, we'd like to invite our two as new members to be received to come forward. I know they're looking just a little anxious, so smile out there, will you? <laughs> Let them know they're welcome here. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I'll come begin on. by introducing Lauren Davis. Lauren, you probably didn't even know wasn't a member. She's been attending here in the summer mostly for the last 50 years because they have a summer home on Lake Ida. Most recently she made the move from Nebraska here, has taken up permanent residence here in Alexandria Yay. right there on Lake Ida and we are delighted to have her joining today. Her hobbies and special interests include music and art and her love of the outdoors. She was attracted to our church because we're small we're welcoming, and we're active in service in the community. Welcome to you, Lauren. Our other new member this morning, Valerie Fox. Um, she found our church through Kirk. So thank you, Kirk, who extended the invitation to come and check us out. Uh, Valerie has recently moved to Alexandria. We'll be making it her home. She is a physician by trade, so that is so exciting. Um, we might be able to talk her into maybe being our congregational <laughs> nurse in the future. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, her hobbies and special interests include quilting and beading. So those quilters in our mists, we know who to, to talk to here. Um, and then she also indicates that uh, she may want to get involved in women's fellowship and friendly services time allows. So I've gotten to know Valerie here in the last few weeks. She's warm, she's inviting, she's got wonderful stories to tell. And so uh, make sure that you give her a warm welcome as she joins our congregation this day. Thank you, Kath. Friends in Christ, we're all received into the church through the sacrament of baptism. Lauren and Valerie have found nurture and support here in the midst of this family of God. Through prayer and discernment, they've been led by God's own spirit to reaffirm their faith here today and to claim in our presence their covenantal relationship with Jesus and the members of this body of Christ. They are here for service in the name of Jesus, using the unique gifts that the Holy Spirit has bestowed upon them. And now we will affirm our faith, Lauren, Valerie, as we unite with the church in all times and places, let us confess our faith in the triune God. Do you believe in God? If so, say, I believe in God. I believe in God. And do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, please affirm publicly, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, respond by saying, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe, I believe in, in the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. And do you promise as God is able by grace to allow to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing as you are able in the worship and enlisting in the work of this local church as it seeks to serve both the community of Alexandria and our world? If so, Please respond by saying together, we promise with the help of God. We promise with the help of God. Thank you. Let us, the members of First Congregational United Church of Christ, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in the name of Jesus as it appears on the screen. We promise, we promise you, you our, our friendship and, and prayers in this, this community. community of the, the Church, Church of, of Jesus Christ. Christ. By, By the, the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit may we continue to grow, to grow as a people of faith, love, and action, both among ourselves and in the world. We welcome, we welcome our newest members with joy as equal partners in the shared ministry of First Congregational United Church of Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Jesus Christ, and on behalf of First Congregational United Church of Christ, we extend the hand of fellowship and Christian love. Welcome into the company of this local church. It is the season of gifts, so of course we have gifts to give today. They'll be receiving a tree ornament with our church logo in the middle, 
as well as one of our beautiful United Church of Christ medallions. And I'd like to invite Glenda Richardson to come forward as she shares the truly coveted name badge. <laughs> so they will, be, they will be identifiable wherever they are. <laughs> Following the service today, we'll have uh, these Thanks, two Linda. process out ahead of Kathy and I. And if you would, please greet them as you leave for the time of fellowship and coffee today. That would be wonderful. So now I say, go in peace and go in service in the name of Jesus. Amen. And welcome to you. Amen. Kathy, it's all you. I can do this. All right. I see that we have kids here yes, today, we so do. if you guys would come on up, I would certainly love to see your beautiful smiling faces joining us this morning. We have a few other youth out there, and I'm going to just embarrass them because they don't like to come up in front of the congregation. So everybody turn around and stare at those guys. There we go. There we go. So, so next time you have no excuse, I'm going to look at you anyway. All right. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right. So I have a question for you guys. But first, I have a, a short story to tell you. So if you'll listen closely. And then I'll ask the question, okay? So pretend that it's the first day of school, and for you guys, the first day of preschool, okay? So let's put that in our head. But not only is it a new school year for you, it's also a new school building, okay? So you don't know your way around this building. And at some point during the first day of school, you have to leave one of your classrooms and go to another classroom, except on the way, you get lost in the hallways, okay? And I know in some of the bigger schools, that's not too hard to, to visualize. So can you imagine kind of getting lost? Yeah? Okay. Now, you see a teacher in the hallway, okay? And this teacher is not a teacher that you know, but you don't care because you just want to get to your classroom, okay? So you say to this new teacher that you don't know, you say, dear teacher in the hallway, because that's what you would say, right? Dear teacher in the hallway. <laughs> I don't know how to get back to my classroom. Can you point me in the right direction? All right, so here's my question. Do you think that this dear teacher in the hallway will help you out? Yeah, okay. Well, it just so happens that the answer is yes, of course this teacher will help you out. And the teacher says, do you see that, that corner down there where you came from? That's where you made a wrong turn. So all you have to do is turn back the other way, go to the corner, take a right, and that's where you need to be. All right, so that's the end of the story. With you following the teacher's instructions, you have a happy and successful return to your teacher. Yay. Well done getting back to your classroom. All right. Okay, so in today's scripture story that Pastor Scott's going to share with us, you're going to hear a, a similar story, except that the regular classroom teacher is Jesus. And the hallway teacher that you didn't know is John the Baptist. In the scripture story, we hear that John the Baptist is out in the middle of the wilderness telling whoever he finds that they need to repent so that they'll be ready for Jesus. And the word repent, do you guys know what that means? It means to turn around, okay, just like we did in the hallway. Okay, the teacher in the hallway said turn around. So all you have to do is go back, turn the other way, and that'll take you where you need to be. So John the Baptist is telling the people the same thing in today's scripture story. He's saying you made some wrong turns, so what you need to do is turn around, go in the other direction, and doing that will get you to the right teacher. 
In a lot of stories, it, see, it certainly seems like Jesus works alone, doesn't it? He's got his disciples, but it's Jesus doing the talking. And so what we're reminded of today in today's story is that there are other teachers out there, like John the Baptist, who help Jesus. These teachers help point people towards Jesus when, when they're new students or if they get turned around or make a wrong turn. And the same is true with us here today. We sometimes get turned around. Yeah, lost, confused. But as a faith community, as a church, all of these people here, Pastor Scott, your family, all of us here together, we help point each other toward Jesus. And that's the good news for today. We can all help Jesus, just like John the Baptist did, by reminding and helping each other and, and keeping our attention on Jesus and his teachings. I'm going to have Andrew, I'm going to have you hold this microphone, if you will. And we're going to do a closing prayer together, okay? And I'm going to start, just like these new guys did, I'm going to say something and then you guys are going to repeat it. So this is a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. And the people who help us remember him. And the people who help us remember him. Please help, help us Please help us to do the same for each other. To do the same for each other. Thank you and amen. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for coming up today. You guys can head back to your seats. And you guys can head back up to the choir. or concerns that you would like to lift with the congregation this day. Very good. We love joys. So we got the Clarks are having a niece having a wedding next. All right, Michelson. There's a, a wedding in the Michelson family. All right, a prayer for Doug in Arizona that the doctors there might find a diagnosis and he can move forward in recovery. Yes, Kylie. Woo woo! All right, Kylie and family into their new home, into their new digs. Lots of prayers that, that the move continues to go smoothly. Any other? Prayers for Shirley Witten, as always. Shirley is, is uh, currently at, I think, Bethany. So uh, I know she would love visits, so if you have time. Any other joys are concerned?
Prayers for those in Ventura County, San Diego County, and California. Our, our hearts ache for them during this season of Advent. May we keep those families uh, that have lost so much and those that live in, in fear at this time uh, that, that they might find peace during this, this season of Advent. Other joys or concerns that you would like to share this morning? One behind you, Kath. Yes, sir. For all of us, that we can find someone and reach them through God this week. Prayers for us as we journey with God during this week and that we might find that connection. All right. So during our prayer time, we will have a short, silent prayer. We'll follow that with a pastoral prayer, and we'll end with the Lord's Prayer using debts and debtors. Let us pray. God of the wilderness, God of the wastelands of our lives, lead us apart to those places where we hear your word most clearly. In the startling awareness of Christ's coming, may we order our lives with compassion. Lord, it is so much easier to talk about the promise of a babe in a manger or even to go ahead and sing Christmas carols during Advent. We want the good news of Christmas, but often without the challenge. We want the birth narrative without the prophet. We want redemption without judgment. As we look around us during this Advent season, where do we see the way being prepared for God to come into our lives? Where are we seeking the teacher in the hallway who tells us to turn around? Where are we seeking the teacher of all life and love? Are the rough and uneven roads being made wide and smooth? Can we hear the voice of the prophet in the midst of all these holiday sounds? I'll praise to you, Emmanuel, God promised. God with us. All praise to you in the silence and in the singing during this sacred season of Advent. As we lit the candle for Advent this morning, for peace and for patience, Lord, let us be a people that remembers the presence of Emmanuel, you with us. Eternal God, we thank you that all through the year, you have given peace to us, your people. Help us to have your peace in our lives. Lord, let us be that teacher in the hallway, pointing the way to you. Let us, by our presence, show your love and light to those who are sick or hungry or lonely, so that they too might feel your peace. Accept our love as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. The scripture reading from the lectionary text comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, 
thought to be the earliest gospel writer. In the first chapter, verses 1 through 8, hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make the straight path for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. The whole Judean countryside, it is written, and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized in the river Jordan. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was the message he shared. After me will come one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. John said, I baptize you with water, but this one I speak of will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends the reading of the Holy Scripture. May God add a blessing to the hearing, understanding, and living of the word this day. Little Susie climbed up onto Santa's lap just two weeks before Christmas, and Santa asked her, as all good Santas do, and what would you like for Christmas, little girl? Susie gasped and she said with an incredulous voice, Santa, didn't you get all of my emails? <laughs> when I was growing up, the two most dreaded words around Christmas time for us kids was companies coming. Those two words never failed to send us all into a panic. Why? Well, because we couldn't just laze around anymore as kids. We had to shift into high gear. We had to clean our rooms and dust and vacuum every inch of the house and naturally being the oldest of the six kids I got all the dirty jobs. I had to shake the rugs and do dishes and take out the garbage and swish out the toilets. I don't long for those days. We had to take a bath even if we didn't need one. We had to get the house ready for our, ourselves and our guests. Company was coming. Everything had to be just so before our special guests arrived. Well, things haven't changed a whole lot these days. Our house still gets a, a little crazier when the phone rings or we, we finally get the email message from our son and daughter-in-law, we're coming home for Christmas. I bet it's the same in your house. Because when company's coming, you've got a, a lot of things to do. You've got to be prepared for their arrival. If I had to sum up part of John the Baptist's message today from the Gospel of Mark, it would be, company's coming, you better get yourselves ready. The company coming was, of course, the promised Messiah sent from God. And for some reason, this really caught my attention this year. The Bible tells us that John came as, quote, the voice of one crying out from the wilderness. Prepare a road for the Lord. Make a straight path for him to travel. Spending time in the wilderness seems is the norm for we who are called God's people. After the Israelites left Egypt, they went into the wilderness. It was their way, I believe, to prepare for entering finally into the promised land. And we're told in the New Testament after Jesus was baptized, he went into the wilderness. It was his way to prepare spiritually for his public ministry. And in today's gospel lesson from Mark, John the baptizer appears in the wilderness helping the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem prepare for the coming of the one more powerful, he says. I want to be clear this morning that the wilderness I'm talking about is, is not just about geography, but also the geography within us. It's interior landscape that I'm speaking of, the, the place of our hearts and our spirits and our minds. And there's absolutely no doubt that the spiritual wilderness can be just as scary as the real wilderness. 
Why? Well, there's nowhere to hide in the wilderness. There are no illusions or distractions in the wilderness. There we are stripped of any illusions of power and control. In the wilderness, we are left to face ourselves, to examine our hearts, to see ourselves clearly, to confess in an honest and often painful way the truth of our lives. I suspect by the look on your faces today, this morning, you know exactly what I'm talking about. My guess that each one of you could tell of a time when you were in the wilderness. I know this because as your pastor, I have been privileged on occasion to walk with you into those dark and scary places. I've heard your heartfelt questions. I've seen your tears, and I have felt your fear. I've prayed with you, and I shared your same longing to hear some good news, to see just a little bit of God's light shining forth in that dark place called the wilderness. Yeah, as difficult as the wilderness can be for us, it, it's still, as it turns out, the only place in which we can prepare the way of the Lord. That's what time in the wilderness does for us. It prepares the way of the Lord. Just one more thing, and, and this is so very important. It's actually a little bit of good news. The wilderness times of our lives are not places of exile, nor are they places where God sends us to be punished any more than God sent Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness, the spiritual wasteland, is a, is a place of self-discovery and new life. It's a place where we discover that we can no longer live by our own self-sufficiency. It's a place where we discover the liberating truth that there is more to life and more to each one of us than what our self-sufficiency can get us. In the wilderness, we ultimately discover that we are in need, and these are John the Baptist's words of the powerful. In that revelatory moment, all of our illusions of self-sufficiency just melt away. And then we are finally, finally ready to receive that gift of new life that God is so eager in love to offer you and me. Speaking of gifts, just before Christmas, two grandmothers were discussing which Christmas gifts they would give their loved children. The first grandmother said, you know, it's always so hard to know what to get those kids for Christmas. So a few years back, I decided just to send a card and a check to each one of them. The second grandmother said, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I do the very same thing. But you know, I rarely receive a thank you from them. Oh, said the first grandma, I got a plan for you. My grandkids always come right over to the house to thank me. Oh, that's wonderful, her friend exclaimed. What's your secret? Oh, it's really simple, she said. I always make sure to forget to sign the checks. <laughs> you no doubt remember, you can use that one, Grandpa and Grandpa. You will no doubt remember that there was a custom back in Jesus' days that when people of a village learned that an important person was coming to town, they would go out on the pathway or the roadway that that person would be traveling and they'd literally pick up all the sticks and trash and toss away the rocks and fill in the potholes. In other words, they would prepare a road. They would make the path straight so that person coming would have nothing to hinder them. You could say that it was their way of rolling out the red carpet. It was their unique way of getting ready for important company. John the Baptist that Mark describes in the Gospel of Mark today saw his job as helping the people of his day and age to prepare a spiritual pathway for the coming of the most important person of all to we Christians, the Messiah, the promised Savior sent from God. But John didn't want the people out on the road picking up trash and filling in holes. The road he wanted them to clear was the pathway to their hearts. It was as if he were saying, clear the road of your heart and soul of anything and everything that could ever or might possibly obstruct Christ's love from coming to your, to your heart. 
Don't, don't let anything get in the way of the Savior. Not bitterness or malice or lust or regret or anger or doubt or unresolved conflict. Not anything. That love is that important. Don't let anything get in the path of God's precious gift of new life coming to you and to me and this world. So as your pastor this morning, I have to ask, what, what is the most hoped for, longed for thing for you in this Advent and Christmas season? If you dream of a life more rewarding and joyful, then you will need to courageously name those things that sap your joy and distract you from your God-given true nature and deplete your energy. And if you hope for a family that is stronger and happier, more loving and more uh, connected, then you will need to learn some new ways, perhaps, and to courageously let go of some old practices and behaviors. And if you dream of a community and a church and a world more at peace and, and more dedicated to what God envisions for all of us, then we will need to learn some new ways and to change our, own, our old attitudes and beliefs as well. That's not easy to do. I've been there, done that. We may rather like our old ways of behaving. Like an old tattered blanket, it's hard to let it go. So we may have to spend some serious time in the wilderness in the next couple of weeks, the wilderness of self-examination and reflection. The good news is that there is hope for peace and new life a stronger family, and an enlivened church and community, even more focused than it already is on the mission of Christ. But Mark wants us to The prophet John must first be heard. Listen. You can almost hear his voice. Still crying from the wilderness. Listen to me. Learn from me. Repent. Turn from the ways that have sent you into darkness. Courageously embrace the need of change. Shed the illusion of self-sufficiency. Dare to grow. Jesus Christ is coming. Prepare your hearts and your souls to receive him. The promised Messiah. God's love son. Our powerful Savior. Amen. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke the bread and he said, eat in remembrance of me. In a similar way, that same evening, we we're told that Christ poured out the fruit of the vine saying, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. And then he added these words for us often. As you partake of, my, of the bread, my body, and drink of the fruit of the cup, my blood, do so in remembrance of my great love for you. The table is spread. The invitation has been extended. Come and see how good our Lord is.
take and drink. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in the ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we may feast at his heavenly banquet. Amen. One way to prepare for Christ's appearance to support the church's mission in our community and beyond, our church's programs are God's good news. Our outreach provides comfort and practical help. And our goals are nothing less than newness of life for all of God's people. May our gifts reflect God's generosity. Will the ushers please come forward? <coughs> All who are able, please rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Create our Son and Holy. join now in our unison prayer of dedication. While we are waiting and preparing for Christ to appear, we are seeking, O oh God, to act as faithful followers. May our offerings extend the promise of salvation to people whose lives are broken by neglect, abuse, bad choices. These gifts offer hope to all whose suffering and loss seem too heavy to bear. May our church be a listening, caring presence for all its members and through us all for all those who meet in our work and leisure. Amen.
have heard God's word, share the good news of Jesus Christ. Prepare the way for Christ to be heard. God's word brings us both comfort and challenge. We are accepted by God and commissioned for duty. You will be fed and blessed on life's way. The baptism of God's own Holy Spirit will guide and sustain you. We turn our hearts and minds toward God. We rejoice that we can be servants in Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace. Can we grab them back here?